Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clements, editor-at-large of Changing America, an editorial section of The Hill aimed at awakening the rising spirit of citizenship across this country. Since launching in the fall of 2019, Changing America has been devoted to telling powerful stories about climate change, diversity and inclusion, education, health, and more stories that inspire and spark thought, define need, and demand action. Thank you for joining us for Changing America's inaugural virtual event, Digital Inclusivity in American Education. As Students across the country head back to one of the most important school years in recent American history. They are facing systemic issues in our education system. One of these was made painfully clear by the COVID-19 pandemic, in which millions of our students don't have access to the technology and high-speed internet they desperately need. Recent reports have found that nearly 20 million Americans still lack access to fixed broadband service. Let me say that again, 20 million Americans. In rural areas, the numbers are even more alarming. Nearly one-fourth of the population doesn't have threshold speed internet service. Services. So how can we tackle the crucial issues of digital inclusivity? And what steps must we take to create equal opportunity for students of all economic backgrounds? How do we support struggling parents and caretakers in their efforts to provide a quality education for children? And can we, as a country, put our education system on course for a successful future in a very much needed digital age? Over the next half hour, I'm going to speak with our esteemed panel of experts to address these questions and more. Uh, together, we'll investigate the barriers created by by inequity and discuss ways that our education system can be improved. I'd like to thank Changing America's presenting sponsors, Verizon and Kia, for their support of today's event. Before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at Changing America using the hashtag Changing America Education. We're broadcasting live, and if you experience any trouble with the live stream, they say this will work. Just push refresh, and I'm sure all will be well. Um, it, it, it sometimes works for me. So with that, I'm honored to now introduce our expert panel. Joining us today is a good friend of the Hills, Representative Chrissy Houlihan, represented from Pennsylvania's 6th Congressional District and co-chair of the Women in STEM Caucus. She's also a former public school teacher, also an uh, officer in the Air Force, co-sponsored the Rebuild America's School Act. It's great to see you again, Representative Houlihan. Maria Echeveste is one of the people who used to help run Washington. I'm jealous because I think she's out in, in uh, Berkeley right now. She's president and CEO of the Opportunity Institute, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance social mobility and equity through education. And she advised on many of these issues in domestic policy in general, President Bill Clinton. Finally, Ed Chang is the founding executive director of Redefined Atlanta, a nonprofit committed to providing a quality public school education for all students. It's a real pleasure to have all of you today. I know there's a lot going on in this August, but this is an important set, set of issues. And so, Representative Houlihan, let me just start with you for a minute. We have a, um, an infrastructure bill that's got in different forms and whatnot. Um, part of that infrastructure bill addresses uh, elements of connecting broadband broadly globally, and I know there are a lot of, but I'm just interested in how you see, to, you know, when we're addressing today's question about inequity in education and the digital infrastructure as part of that, what do you think is likely to get fixed as if that infrastructure bill does come out in some form and is signed by President Biden? And what doesn't get fixed? What remains a lift in our own thinking about how we deliver um, education? I'm going to take Maria Echeveste's uh, notion of a whole child. How do we make the whole child succeed um, uh, it, with, with, with our legislative approach in the infrastructure bill? Uh, sure, and thanks very much for organizing this really important conversation about uh, equity and specifically you know, broadband and digital equity. Uh, we know we have an issue of equity. We've seen it firsthand as a result of the pandemic. Uh, many people who weren't necessarily tuned in to uh, what sort of disparities there are in the country uh, now really understand them in some cases firsthand when it comes to how we deliver information, how we deliver opportunity, how we deliver jobs uh, to all of the people who live in our country. And you're right, we have some good opportunities with new federal investments. Uh, there's a hundred uh, million dollars that are proposed under President Biden's jobs plan. And as you mentioned, there's about 65 billion that are included in the Senate's uh, bipartisan infrastructure framework as well. Um, we know that we need to make sure that we're extending and expanding broadband access to all of the folks who don't currently have it. And importantly, it's uh, not where you necessarily think it is. I, ha I live in uh, out just outside of Philadelphia. Some of my community is rural. Much of my rural community does not have access to broadband. As you mentioned, I also was an educator in North Philadelphia, uh, right in the heart of the city. Uh, and many of my children, kids, and their parents didn't have access to regular, reliable, and, and high stream uh, broadband there either. 
this is an issue of equity. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody has access to this because, as I mentioned, this is the opportunity that, that effectively levels the play, playing field. It allows kids to be able to be educated fairly and to understand the, uh, uh, the technology that they're going to be asked to, to use as adults fairly. People in the workforce are, are necessarily going to be able to have access to that technology and need to have it equally and evenly. And importantly, when we're talking about equity as well, I also want to focus in on uh, women. Um, uh, women, it's estimated, have much less access to broadband technology than men do. As we know, we're 51% of the population, both in this country and, and globally as well. And if we don't include all of the women as well in access to technology such as broadband, we're missing out on quite a lot of our population. And as a result, a lot of innovation and, uh, and entrepreneurial ideas are going to be missed out on as well. So even if we had you know, uh, equitable broadband, I think your point is correct to ask what is left what's the lift? I guess I would probably say at that point in time, it's trying to bring people, women and girls particularly, and communities of color along to understand that they have a part and a place in this digital economy and to understand that they need to, and, and we want them to be part, uh, part of that solution set. And that's gonna involve STEM and STEAM education and a variety of other kinds of literacy efforts as well, uh, which would be ongoing work of the Congress. Well, thank you. Maria, I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well, but. I, I guess the thing that I fear in this topic is that people think, um, you know, I, I think I think Representative Poulihan put it well, you know, create a level playing field. But that's just the start of a lot of responsibility I think we have when it comes to thinking about how do we deal with, I think, what you've called the whole child and the other dimensions. So I guess I want to ask you the, a kind of loaded question. If we were going to have the best conversation today we could about producing the whole child, and but also looking at broadband access, looking at skills, but what are the pieces of, of this conversation that often don't get included that we need to include? Well, I think that to start off, many of us who've been working in the issue of equity and education understood that there was, in fact, an uneven playing field. Um, the pandemic revealed it for the entire country. Mm. And and this, this, to me, creates an urgency for all of us to recognize that we are in it together and the future is a digital future. We see that over and over again. So what we learned uh, through the pandemic as suddenly schools closed and we had to go to remote learning was what many of us knew that, that as the Congresswoman said, there were many Americans who, and families and children who had no access to either devices or to broadband. So we scrambled. Um, Turns out that the school districts that had better relationships with their families knew who those families were and were able, for example, here in Berkeley, California, were able to identify those families, get devices to them, get them hotspots. But, but states across the country scrambled to pull together funds for devices, for hotspots. The question I have really for all of us is that was stopgap, that was Band-Aid. What the Congresswoman said about how we invest as a country and state to ensure access, internet access needs to be seen as a basic right as a person living in this, in this country and frankly in the world because without access to the internet, you will be limited in your opportunities. And we need to think of internet access as the kind of utility that you know we electrified the country many many decades ago because we saw that as essential for bringing all of americans together and progressing we need to think of internet access that way i think that you know luckily here in california we have some resources the governor just signed um last month a bill that's uh, uh, $6 billion multi-year to really ensure uh, middle mile and last mile for especially our rural and low-income families. But we need federal support as well. And, and I think what the congressman, allu uh, Congresswoman alluded to, um, how we Congress and the Biden administration really uh, make real that commitment mm. to ensure internet access. 
I appreciate that. You know, Ed, Ed, let me bring you in. And I know in Atlanta, I'd love to hear more about Redefined Atlanta. It sounds like a great thing. But you've sort of addressed, you know, the broad side of, you know, and you have a responsibility to every child in the system, you know, through that. And I know, we, you know and I should also say that while we're focusing a little bit on K through 12 here today, I think a lot of these um, accessibility issues and connectivity issues also matter for, for those that are in community colleges from around the country. I mean, it's a, it's a broad issue. Um, but I also like the fact that you were touching the mental health of students. And, and maybe Maybe you can give us a snapshot of how you look at the stress and strain of these last 18 months and, and what you think w will help remedy it so that we're not leaving children behind, um, both because of the pandemic and the issues, but that we're actually be beginning to try to change the vector of opportunity uh, for some of those communities that have been, I guess, systemically neglected in the past. Ed? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that question. I, I think. Um to Congressman and Maria's point, the pandemic not only um, showed some of the inequities, but they amplified the inequities that have already existed in this country for a really long time. Um, from an education perspective, we saw all these achievement gaps widen. And in addition to just the digital divide, there were so many of our families that experienced food insecurity, housing insecurity, and job loss, right? And so it's really hard as a family to focus on your child's education if you're more worried about a roof over your head, putting food on the table. And unfortunately, so many of these inequities affect our black, brown, and under-resourced students and families the most. And you know, as I think about um, mental health, as I think about um, trauma that families have experienced over, over this time, from an educational perspective, what I've learned over the past couple decades as an educator is that parents really want four things from their schools and school systems. They wanna know their baby is safe, happy, loved, and able to learn. And quite honestly, probably in that order. And when children feel safe, happy, and loved, it creates the conditions for them to learn. And we really believe that students are receiving that great education when there's consistent achievement and growth among all the students, regardless of race, class, or designation. Um, and without providing every student with equitable access to educational opportunities and resources, including internet and technology, hmm. without access to the same tools, knowledge, support, and teaching, and social services, I think we're going to continue to see those wide achievement gaps amongst white, black, and Latinx students and, and folks experiencing poverty. Well, thank you. Well, Representative Houlihan, I, I guess I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get this out right, but I'm going to try. I mean, this is a conversation. But one of the um, things that haunts me a little bit when we have these conversations is the experience of a friend of mine, Jim McKelvey, in St. Louis. Jim created Launch Code and, and was a co-founder of the company called Square. And in Launch Code, it was really designed to help people um, um, elders, uh, people from people who had health issues and challenges, but how to turn them into world-class coders. And what he found is that they had, may have come through community colleges or universities, but they really didn't have the skill sets in place. So Launch Code helped them do this. When they when they graduated and they were world-class co coders, but they may have had some other speed bump in their life, that it was hard for them to get jobs. And so he began using his sort of semi-celebrity status and calling the CEO of Cisco, calling whatever and saying, you know, your human resources departments aren't taking risks. They're basically looking at me. So I guess the other part of this question, let's just presume for a moment that we get digital um, uh, connectivity solved. We get devices in the hand of the people. We even train them and get the skills level up across the board. These are all big lifts. But I also worry about, what is our ongoing responsibility to remove the biases in the system or the fear of actually working with people that have worked themselves? I mean, is that a fair question? I know you've worked as an educator and, and you feel so strongly about this, but I'm interested in if we get the digital stuff right, what else do we have to do next? Because there's a lot of bias built into our system. So I guess I would take that uh, answer with two, two in two prongs. One is it's not enough just to have access. And to your point, you know, we have to make sure that, that we're uh, raising up uh, digitally literate people, no matter how old they are, no matter what part of their life they're mm. in, uh, to be able to have those skills. And that means that they frankly have to have some of the basic literacy skills down. Uh, I, my experience of being a chemistry teacher uh, in 11th grade uh, chemistry was my kids were reading at the third and fourth grade level, and it was going to be pretty darn hard to uh, kind of uh, Im Im imbue them with chemistry skills and allow them to be high functioning and high performing uh, adults in our community without those 
those fundamental literacy skills, mm -hmm. financial literacy skills, numeracy skills, all of those are the kinds of things that we need to be focused on in order to get to that place where you're talking about with your friend and establishing a different pathway, a different network to get people into our jobs market mm -hmm. with the skills that they with the that the community and that the country needs. And we do need to have better and more open minds, not just uh, in our corporations and our corporate mindset of what we're looking for mm. when we're looking to hire somebody, but also frankly, our parents uh, and educators have to have those broader mindsets too. I think that there's this kind of thing that, that people assume that every child should go to college for the skills that they need. I think it's increasingly more evident to people that that's not always the case. And in fact, our economy is crying out for people with other kinds of skills that don't necessarily fit into the box of two or four year education. Uh, and your example of digital literacy and coding might be one of them. So it's gonna take kind of a, a corporate culture change. It's gonna take a, 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 a civilian or a family culture change as well to recognize what kind of skills people need to be able to match up with the needs of the economy. Before I jump to Maria uh, real quick, um, Congresswoman, I've always said we're all storytellers and, 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 you know, you're out there trying to work on, you know, rebuilding schools, you know, look at how we get folks connected, deal with, you know, uh, promoting STEM, uh, particularly for women and girls, but, you know, across the, across the board. I'm interested, who are the villains in the story? Who's in the way? Who's trying to stop these things from moving forward in a positive way? You know, I don't think that there's a lot of intentional villains in this story. I just think that they are negligent or unintentional villains. It's hard when I'm sitting in my community talking about kids that live 10 miles from here mm. that are not part of my district, not part of my community, to make sure that people understand that they are their babies too, uh, and that their their lives and, and successes and, and happiness and health is really tied to our lives and success and happiness and health here in our community, 10 or 11 miles away from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And so I think a lot of it is just understanding and education. Uh, and I think mm. uh, going back to the pandemic, the unfortunate uh, pandemic that we're all experiencing right now, it's one of the more fortunate aspects of it is it has opened our eyes, eyes of, of people who haven't necessarily been tuned into the inequities that exist just down the road from where they live. Uh, and so I think we, we do need to make sure that we're bringing everybody along in the conversation of why this conversation is important, even if you happen to have digital literacy and digital access. Maria, are, are, thank you for that. Maria, are there things that we're missing, again, on the, on the digital opportunity side of this? You know, I'm thinking about your organization, the Opportunity Institute, but you know, one of, the, I think, the big challenges in America right now is a deficit in empathy, a deficit in people caring about each other. And I'm just, you know, maybe it's naive of me. I'm just wondering, is there some you know, trick up our sleeve with you know, the digital side of this where people can understand? I've just finished a book called Lifelines by Dr. Lena Wen, and you may know Lena Wen, who who's a CNN medical analyst, but she came to America as an eight-year-old, non-English speaking girl from Shanghai. Her parents had $40. They, they had a terrible, terrible time growing up. She, was, she had physical issues and uh, uh, issues that she had occurred. So I interviewed her yesterday, and I was blown away by the generosity that she met in Logan, Utah, and the people and programs that her family had access to that helped go from very tough circumstances to obviously she's a big sick success today. And I'm just asking myself, well, we're in the digital world. Can we, like, improve those kinds of things better? So your thoughts on that? Well, I, I want to say absolutely we can do better. And, but I want to return to something that Ed said, which is it isn't just about digital. It's, the reality is we need to understand the science of learning and development has established that trauma, adversity, poverty impact a child's ability to learn. But it's also shown us that the brain is incredibly malleable and with the right interventions, the right supports, um, a ch any, any child can learn. And we know that from the kind of work that's been done for children with disabilities under mm. the um, IDEA, Individual uh, Disabilities Education Act. So d digital access hmm. and what we can ex expose through our use of the internet to, to get to know people who are different from us, who have different experiences. Yes, that can help hmm. us. You know, there is some data that shows that the greatest anti-immigrant um, attitudes are in places where there are few immigrants. That is, people don't 
interconnect. Right. Um, and you have places like California or parts of the coast where it's much more integrated. Um, and so there's there's less of that bias, if you will. But I want to also stress that the pandemic, coupled with the racial reckoning spurred by the George Floyd murder, mm -hmm. really showed the systemic problems in our society. And the fact was, the majority of essential workers who had to go out there, make sure there was food in the grocery stores, who were working in the right. grocery stores, who were performing the essential services, mm -hmm. were often low income, um, working class families, while the rest of us who were college educated and were able to work from home um, could protect ourselves from the pandemic. It really calls, I think, all of us to ask, OK, how do we change this? Right. We will have more pandemics. But we were depending on people who at the moment are one month, you know, the eviction moratorium mm -hmm. may pre will expire and they may become homeless. So right. there are many, many places for us to roll up our sleeves. Digital access is one piece of it, but it has to be put in the context of what kind of society do we want for uh, for our children and our grandchildren. Right. Well, uh, that's powerful. And, and look, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I know that Representative Houlihan has a has a hard stop, which I regret. But I want to, you know, uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, do maybe thirty seconds for you. Maybe gonna do a very unfair question. Ed, you reel with real people. I'd love to hear a real life story in thirty seconds or forty five seconds of someone impacted by opportunity on the digital space if you have something of some child's life that you may have impacted or some concern you know downside of not having that opportunity and I'd, I'd like to ask the same thing of representative Houlihan and Maria before we close but Ed sure I mean I, I think like again to Maria's point I, I think part of the digital divide piece the impact of that grew bigger from some of the trauma and some of the other life factors that happened. And so we created a fund um, in Atlanta um, to address community members' most pressing needs. And, and when the digital divide and all this stuff closed down from right. COVID before, um, Atlanta as a city um, partnered with lots of local organizations. Millions right. of dollars were spent to give everybody access to hotspots and devices and things like that. And yet, um, so this is the innovation. We I've got to bring it to a quick close. I apologize, but yeah. please oh, give, sorry, give, yeah. give us the nugget of it real quick. Yeah. So if within the innovation fund, so we, we did two things. We established a hundred thousand dollar fund to address community members most pressing needs. And those pressing needs ended up being rent, food and utility bills. Uh, because, again, like if you didn't have if you couldn't pay for electricity, it doesn't matter that you have a hot spot and it doesn't right. matter if you have a device. So those were the things that were we were finding that. $300, $500 made a huge difference in the lives to be able to have children actually access education right. through the technology. Well, terrific. I think we lost Representative Houlihan, unfortunately. But Maria, I'd love, I'd love to ask you the same question, because storytelling and stories help people understand this more. But I'd love to hear something where you think some of these issues made a real difference in people's lives. Well, um, one that comes to mind um, that I think we need to explore, and it kind of relates to what the Congresswoman was saying before. It turns out that remote learning was actually really good for some students. Um, hmm. High school, adolescence is incredibly difficult for so many, um, especially now with social media. And I think we need to look more carefully at how do we create the flexibility for some students who are filled with anxiety and all the social pressures that they were able to thrive being working from home? And the other piece that isn't um, as well known is for a lot of students of color, not especially if they're the, a small group of African-American students or Latino students in a predominantly white school, being able to go to school remotely actually lessened some of the pressure on them of having to be the only one in a math class or the only one in a, in a AP English class. And I think that opening our eyes to the positive side of digital and remote learning, while at the same time recognizing 
that especially for adolescents, this is and elementary school, this is a time in which those social skills, the communications, learning to work mm -hmm. with others in a in a face-to-face -face way is also important. So I think right. we've got some big questions and challenges facing us that that this pandemic and the importance of digital literacy really exposed. Well, listen, I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I want to thank uh, Representative Chrissy Houlihan, who had to depart a little early, uh, representative uh, representing Pennsylvania's 6th Congressional District, Ed Chang, doing great things in Atlanta, Executive Director of Redefined Atlanta. So interesting, and I look forward to talking more down the road if you'll come back about the Innovation Fund. Uh, and Maria Echeveste, President and CEO of the Opportunity Institute. When Maria was here in Washington helping to run this place, I was a big fan. I worked for Senator Jeff Bingaman back in the 90s, and it's great to see you again. Seeing you doing great, great things. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Our pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, that brings us to the end of our program and our conversations. They were real wonderful. A big thank you to Kia and Verizon for all their support and to all of you attendees. And for anyone who missed any part of the program this afternoon, we'll have the video up from the event on our website shortly. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well. <laughs>